Thank you all. It's such a generous introduction. I could listen to you all night if you'd like to come. <laughs> well, um, you know I almost love you because I've come up here on the high holy day, or the high holy weekend of my people. I speak, of course, of the LSU Alabama game, <laughs> which is tomorrow night. So we'll all need to have a little moment of prayer for the Tigers. And, uh, uh, it was also great to come up here, too, to where there's actual autumn. I mean, I could, I, my wife is so jealous. I got to put on corduroys and got to put on a scarf because in Louisiana, it's still mosquito time. Um, last October, I went to Florence. Uh, I made my first trip to Florence because I wanted to go see the sites that Dante had written about. And uh, it was just a magnificent, it was a pilgrimage for me. It really was a literary pilgrimage and a spiritual pilgrimage. And I ended up going to Ravenna, where, where he's buried, and prayed at his tomb. And um, it was really special. But I knew that I was going to be back from Florence in time for Halloween. And uh, I said, you know what? I want to go as Dante this Halloween. <laughs> so it turns out that in Florence, near where I was staying, there's a little costume shop called Filistrucchi. It's been there making costume and makeup for the opera and, and the theatrical productions since the 1700s. So I went in there and said, I'd like you to make me something. I'd like you to make me a Dante nose, because Dante had such a prominent and distinctive nose. And I brought it home to wear uh, for my Halloween costume last year. Something came up at the last minute. I didn't get to wear it. And again, I'm away this Halloween, too. But I brought my Dante <laughs> nose. <laughs> and uh, I have a little glue at home. I can put this on theatrical glue. but. Uh, this is what the great man's nose looked like. <laughs> it's sort of a relic of my journey. <laughs> um, as you can probably tell, I am not a scholar. And if you come tonight to hear a scholarly discussion of Dante, you're going to be sorely disappointed. I'm not even a reader of fiction. I'm a ravenous reader, always have been. And what I read is nonfiction. I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm I've got three or four books going at all times. My wife is a big reader of fiction, and she stayed after me for the longest time. You know, you, you really should read fiction. I said, you know, I, I'd like to, but I just, I can't get into it. She goes, you'd really learn a lot from fiction. Like, I know, I know, I know, but I just, it's just not for me. And then I stumbled across Dante, and he changed my life in a profound way. Or I should say, God changed my life through Dante, because the fact that it's called the Divine Comedy, not the name Dante gave it, but it was called that later, because it's all about the journey to God, uh, it, it hit me in a way that I never anticipated. So the talk I'm going to give tonight is not the talk of a scholar, but the talk of a witness. I made this journey with Dante the Pilgrim, the two Dantes, Dante the Poet, the author of the Divine Comedy, and Dante the Pilgrim, the character Dante who goes on this journey. I walked with him through the fiery pit of hell, up a winding mountain road of purgatory, and flew with him through space to see the face of God. But in truth, the journey I made with Dante was a journey into my own heart, the depths of my own heart. I ended up fighting dragons there that were in caves I didn't know existed. And at the end of the journey, I was made whole. And the instrument of my healing was this poem that, as I said, God used to reach me when I, nothing else could. This 700-year-old uh, poem, The Divine Comedy, 14,233 lines of rhymed work, it did for me what its author, Dante Alighieri, wanted it to do and wants it to do for everyone who reads it. Dante said to one of his patrons in a letter, that he intended his poem to bring people from a state of misery to a state of bliss. That happened to me. It really did. I can't think of another book that did this to me, but it had this work of fiction, this poem did it. Um, before I tell you how God healed me through this poem and this amazing adventure I had in this poem, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dante himself, Dante Alighieri. He was born in 1265 in Florence. And uh, at that time, Florence was the richest and most powerful city in Europe. It was a fantastic time to be born there if you were born to be an artist. And he was, because that was a, a real, uh, the Renaissance had not yet happened 
as it did later in Florence, but there was a, 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 a small renaissance of vernacular poetry going on there, and Dante joined that group of poets. It was a difficult time to be there, though, because Florence was just eaten up with political rivalries. The two political parties were the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. The Ghibellines supported the Holy Roman Emperor, and the Guelphs supported the Pope, who was in those days as much a, uh, a temporal ruler as the head of the church. And they were constantly fighting, constantly fighting. The whole fight, the, the, it became like a civil war when one of the parties insulted a member of the other party and they sought revenge and assassinated a man as he came off the Ponte Vecchia, the old bridge, on Easter Sunday morning, and that started all the clans fighting. And the, the war went on for about 100 years. Dante was born into this, and uh, he was a member of the Guelph Party. Uh, he, got, uh, he, he made his name early on as a poet, but then he got into politics. And uh, he was eventually made one of the six governors of the city of Florence. Very powerful position. By that time, the Guelphs had driven the Ghibellines out, but the Guelphs factionalized into the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs. <laughs> the, uh, the leader uh, of the, the, the other side was a guy named Corso Donati. He came into town. He connived with the Pope to lead Dante out on a diplomatic mission to Rome. And while Dante was gone, they took over the city. They had a coup. They tried him in absentia and told him, if you come back here, we'll kill you. Uh, they took all his money. They took all his power. They would not let him come back to see his family. He was in exile. He never saw the city of Florence again. Dante had done everything right. He was in the middle of his life. Uh, he was about 37 years old, I would say, around that, that age. He had done everything right. And now he found himself penniless, powerless, shamed, and exiled from his city. And he did not know why this happened. The script did not work. So he thought about, in his exile, he wandered in exile for many years and died in Ravenna in exile. And the answer to the question of why did this happen to me is his poem, The Commedia. Over 14,000 lines about love, hate, war, peace, God, the devil, and all of life. It's right there. It even, I kid you not, has a demon who farts into a trumpet. <laughs> I mean, that's quality literature. <laughs> My kids love that stuff. So where does Dante's tale of exile and homecoming fit into my own? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. I grew up in St. Francisville, Louisiana, a town of 1,700 people, um, just north of Baton Rouge on the Mississippi River. I was the only son, uh, and the only son, of a countryman, a southern gentleman who could do anything. My dad was one of these amazing people you only read about in books. He was physically strong. He was uh, an athletic hero back in the day. He was a big hunter, a fisherman. He could fix anything. He, he got tired of splitting wood with an ax one year, so he invented a woods, hydraulic wood splitter and built it himself, and it's still working. 40 years later. Um, he named me after himself, but that was about all we had in common was our name. He wanted a son who loved to hunt, to fish, to play football, to be outside, and to do country boy things. What my dad got was a nerdy bookworm who had a very soft spot for animals and did not want to shoot a living thing. <laughs> it was really very funny. My, my poor dad, I learned how to read at an early age, and my dad was very, my dad was one of the most intelligent men I've ever known, but his was an engineer's intelligence, and he had no room at all for flights of fancy. But when I was a little kid, I was such an intense reader that I would, uh, I would just start living through these characters, and I would demand that my parents call me by the names of these characters <laughs> in the storybook. <laughs> well, my favorite, one of my favorite characters was Pedro, a resourceful little burro, and a story about the Southwest. And I insisted my parents call me Pedro. Boy, that, my dad. <laughs> It just humiliated him because his friends would talk to me, hey, Rod, I just would look straight past them, and my, and my dad would kind of poke me, say hello, and I wouldn't say anything, and my mom would say, he wants to be called Pedro. <laughs> and these old country guys would laugh, hey, Pedro, well, hey, how you doing? So my dad said to me one day, well, Pedro, we brought, and I'm like four or five at this time, Pedro, we brought Rod home from the hospital. If you're Pedro, where's Rod? 
And I said, oh, he's in the top of the sweet olive tree at Aunt Lois's house. <laughs> my, my great great aunts lived in a little cabin uh, in a pecan orchard near our house. So my dad said, oh, I'm going to do reverse psychology. He goes, well, let's go get him. So he walked into the pecan orchard, and we're standing there. My two elderly aunts come out on the front porch <laughs> of their cabin, and they're laughing at my dad with his shock of red hair. And his face is getting red because he's angry. He says, okay, Pedro, you see there's nobody up in that tree. Start, and I start going, Rod, Rod, Daddy, he's not coming. Keep calling. And finally, I started climbing the tree to shake it down. And I said, Daddy, he's not coming down. And my dad got so mad, and he got so mad at my aunts for laughing at him, he just took me home. Go on. So this was, I mean, I, I, it, it was funny, but it was also kind of sad because I wanted nothing more than the approval of my dad because he was such a wise man. All the people in our town looked at him as one of the wise men of the town, and they would come to him for advice. And he, he, there was nothing he didn't know. Um, and I felt that uh, he was very tender with me and my sister Ruthie, my younger sister Ruthie, but there was always that distance because I, he just couldn't hide that he, he looked at me as his mini-me, and I wanted to be the mini-me, but I just couldn't. My younger sister Ruthie, however, was the son my father never had. <laughs> she loved all these things, like all the hunting, all the fishing. She really was a cheerleader and the homecoming queen who knew how to use a shotgun. She would go deer hunting. She knew how to skin a buck with a knife. She knew how to run a trot line. She was a living, walking Hank Williams Jr. song. Um, <laughs> She was, in my dad's mind, the good one, the one who turned out the way she was supposed to be because she lived according to the script. Um, it's overstating matters to say I was a black sheep, but I was definitely the outsider to my dad, and I felt like an outsider in our town, too. Small southern towns in the 70s, are, um, it was, there was one way to be, and if you weren't that way, you were on the margins. In my high school, I was bullied, like uh, other kids who were interested in books and um, not interested in big belt buckles and cowboy boots and country music. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just, yeah, I'm trying to give you the impression that there was just one way to be in this town, or if you weren't that way, you know, you were discarded. Um, I was bullied, and I couldn't get my dad to understand what was happening. And he, at one point, he blamed me for it. He said, why are you bringing this on yourself? Why are you so weird? And it was it's got to be such a bad thing that I, I had an opportunity to go out to a boarding school in North Louisiana for the, the state started a school for gifted kids. Uh, it was a school you would go live there, like starting college early. And I left at 16, um, thanking God that I got out of there, out of my dad's house, out of my town. I remember standing on the ferry. We had a ferry connecting us to the town across the river, Mississippi. I remember looking back as the ferry left West Feliciana Parish, where I'm from, seeing the banks of the uh, West Feliciana side thinking, I'm never coming back. Of course, I would come back for the holidays, but as far as living there, I'm done. Well, I ended up going my way in my life, and my sister Ruthie went hers. We both ended up at LSU in Baton Rouge. Um, I studied journalism. She studied elementary education. She went back to our hometown to teach uh, middle school in the school we had attended. She married her high school sweetheart. They built a house right across the, the yard from my mom and dad on family land. And they started a family there, and everything was perfect. I, on the other hand, followed a career in journalism, went to the East Coast, to D.C. I went down to South Florida. I was a film critic at the New York Post for a while, and I was very, very happy moving around because I, I was following what I wanted to do with my life and I thought was my calling. Um, but I ended up later, after I married and had kids, I started to, my, my writing took a turn to write about rootlessness and the loss of a sense of family and a sense of place in American life. I longed for it in the worst way because I had really grown up in an, in an idyllic place, even though, I mean, I suppose maybe the nostalgia of thinking back on the childhood, I'd forgotten <laughs> the sense of disconnection. But, um, but I longed to go back and have that. I didn't think I ever could. My sister did have it, though, and she, she and her husband really flourished there in the town. Well, in, in the year 2010, I just moved with my wife and kids from Dallas to Philadelphia to start a new job. And uh, my sister Ruthie started, she went to the doctor. She was having a persistent cough that she couldn't get rid of. They diagnosed lung cancer, which was such a shock. She was 40 years old, in very good health, never smoked a day in her life. But by the time they found it, it was stage four. 
Um, she lived for 19 months before she died suddenly at home in the arms of her husband of a, um, a, blood, uh, a blood vessel burst in her lungs and she died. Uh, but she was very close to the end from the cancer. Um, but over the course of that 19 months, she absolutely changed my life. I saw, even though I was in Philly, I would check on my, we, we come from a close family, I would check on them every day, uh, multiple times a day. I would fly down when I could to see what was going on, to visit with my sister. Um, I saw so much courage, so much love. She had so much light peeling off her face. Um, she was an inspiration to everybody in this town loved her so much, actively loved her, supported her and her family and my mom and dad. It really changed my, my, my whole view of the town and what community could mean. When my sister died, we flew down for the funeral and I remember at her being at her wake in our little Methodist church in town and over a thousand people came. We don't know how many because the, the book stopped at a thousand and people couldn't, there's nowhere else for people to sign, but they kept coming. And people would say to me, sir, you don't know me, but she was my teacher, and here's what she did for me. And I was discovering a part of my sister I had never known. And I remember standing out front uh, of the church as people were milling around, thinking, this is such a beautiful thing. This is what community means. If something happened to me or my wife in Philly, one of us were struck, you know, found out we had stage four cancer, what would we do? It's not that people in Louisiana are necessarily better than people from Philadelphia though we play better football. Um, <laughs> but Julie and I had never lived in any one place long enough to put down the roots that my sister had and get to know what a community means. And for me, the paradox was the same tight community bonds that I felt held me down and held me back when I was a kid, now those are the only things holding my family at, in Louisiana together. Mm -hmm. Julie and I prayed about it and felt a calling to go back and help my mom and dad and to help my brother, my widowed brother-in-law raise their, their girls. And uh, we, we moved back that year in Christmas of 2011, three months after Ruthie died, we came home for Christmas. And uh, I got a book deal out of it. Uh, David Brooks of the New York Times had been reading my blog where I'd been writing about all this and he said, this is an amazing story about what it means to, be, to, to live in community. I'd love to write a column about it. I said, I'd be honored. I got a book deal out of it, and so I was going to end up writing this, this heartwarming story of the prodigal son coming home, even though I hadn't really been a prodigal. I'd done really well in my life, but, you know, my, as far as my dad and my sister were concerned, I had been the prodigal because I'd wasted the inheritance they gave me uh, of culture and family and place. So I was going to write this Hollywood book about the happy ending, a sister's tragic death, but it healed a lifelong rift and helped me come back home. And I gave my dad something he wanted more than anything else, his son and his grandchildren back at home on the land where they belonged. Well, I just about finished writing the book when I, uh, I had one more chapter left to write. It was going to be the end chapter. And I, I took my niece, Hannah, my sister's oldest daughter, who was 19. I took her to France. She was suffering really really seriously for my sister's death because she had been the she would struggled with it the most and I'd always promised her one day Uncle Rod will take you to Paris because I'd gotten her interested in Hemingway when she was in high school and um, but I, I didn't ever had the money to do it well now I had a little bit of money I said let's go so we went for Easter that year uh, her spring break from LSU and on our last night there in Paris she said to me Uncle Rod I have to be honest with you I know you and Aunt Julie came back and you're hoping that our family will be back together, but it's, I don't think it's gonna happen. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, our mom raised us to dislike you and distrust you. She taught us you were bad. And Papa, which is to say my dad, he backed her up on this. Said, what are you talking about? Well, my sister had raised those kids to think that because I had moved away and turned my back and been disloyal this is the deep south. This is how we are. You know, loyalty is everything. And I turned my back on it, and that could not be forgiven. I never knew this because my sister, all these years, I would come back, and she was always smiling. She was so tender and kind, but she nursed this grudge. And she never would show it, but she taught her kids, don't ever trust him, don't ever receive him. And Hannah told me, she goes, I know mama was wrong, but I only knew mama was wrong when I got to be an older teenager and started coming to visit you and Aunt Julie. My, my sisters, who were at that time like 12 and 10, they don't know this at all, and I don't think they're going to give you a chance. 
I felt my whole world collapse right there on the street on the Boulevard Saint-Germain in Paris. I know exactly where I was when it happened, and I started to cry. I cried over the waste of all this. I cried because I felt like a fool. I had believed in family. I had believed this stupid story of, oh, we're such a close family, and you know, we just want you home, and, and it'll be all great. It was all a lie. And I felt like I've made a fool of myself, and I've tricked my wife and my kids here. Now they're stuck in a little town in South Louisiana, and I've been here, lured her into false pretenses. I went back home and confronted my dad about it, and he denied any of it, denied it was true. But I knew he was lying because Hannah had told me some things he had said that only my dad would have known about. But that's my family. We can't face anything that's, that's, that's not the perfect story. Um, but that's where it was. We were there. We couldn't move. Uh, and it was true. My sister's family more or less shunned us after that, and my father kept justifying it. He told me that I needed to work harder to make those girls love me. And I said, they're not going to love me. I've I, we had done so much for them, and they just kept us at arm's length. I said, and Hannah told us why, what Ruth, the way Ruthie raised them. And he said, well, can you blame them? Y'all are so damn weird. <laughs> that's how he put it. And I'm um, sorry to cuss in a church, but that's what he said. <laughs> Um, and I realized then this is hopeless, that he's telling me you have to keep pushing that rock up the mountain, but you can never make it. Um, I got really, really sick physically. I became depressed, but I got physically ill too, and I was finally diagnosed with chronic mononucleosis um, at the age of like 45, 46. And um, it, it was a weird thing. Nobody, the doctors didn't expect it, but I was having to sleep like five hours in the middle of the day. I had no energy. I never wanted to leave the house. I was flat on my back. Um, my wife said, you've got to go see a rheumatologist to see if there's something underneath wrong, be beneath the mono. And so he tested me and said, no, there's, you, know, <coughs> you do have mono, but there's no other cause for it. When this happens, we know that it's caused by intense stress. What are you stressed out over? I told him. He said, well, you're just going to have to leave Louisiana or you're never going to get your health back. I said, I can't leave Louisiana. I've moved my family so many times and my mom and dad are here and it's difficult with them, but I, I just can't leave them. They're old and I'm the only child left. He said, well, brother, you better find inner peace or you're not going to make it. Well, there's no exile like being on the gate, at the very gate of your father's house and being told you can't come in because you're bad. And that's what it was. And yet, we had such a loving family. I mean, it sounds awful to hear me talk about how my dad was, my mom, and the rest of them, but it, was, it wasn't a simple case of like the great Santini or something. It was, <laughs> it was complicated, and I could not figure any of this out. I just kept getting sicker and sicker. Then one day, I was in a bookstore in Baton Rouge, um, in a Barnes & Noble killing time, and I found myself in the poetry section. Why I was there, I don't know. I don't read fiction, and I really don't read poetry. <laughs> but there I was. And I saw on the shelf several copies, translations of the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. And I thought, you know, I, I've always kind of wanted to read that, but I'm the guy who wants to have read something without actually <laughs> reading it. So I can discourse in a knowledgeable way about, well, you know, as, as the poet said. But um, I th said, you know, I missed my chance. I never read it in high school, never read it in college. I'm too old. It's too hard. I felt like maybe uh, like I was standing at the bottom of the literary equivalent of Mount Everest, knowing that I could not scale this peak. But for some stupid reason, I pulled the book off the shelf and opened it. And the first lines of the Inferno, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood, for I had lost the straight path. And I thought, that's... That's me. That's how I am. That's what it feels like right now. I'm in the middle of the journey of my life. I'm having a midlife crisis. I thought I had everything figured out, but I came home and realized that everything I thought was true, was most true, is not true. And I kept reading. And in the beginning of the poem, Dante, the, the character Dante, is in a dark wood. And he, he doesn't know how he got there. And this is, of course, symbolic of the poet being kicked out of Florence, his exile. In the poem, the character Dante, he, he tries to leave of his own accord to get out of this woods, but wild animals stop him at every, every turn. These are symbolic of his sins. So he can't, his sins are so great that he can't save himself. 
And uh, I'm still reading here the first and the second cantos of Inferno. Suddenly, out of the mist, a ghost appears, or the shade of Virgil, the great Roman poet, uh, whom the poet Dante had revered. And it's Virgil there, and he says, I can show you the way out of here. It's going to be a long, difficult walk, but you've got no choice. If you want to live, you have to follow me. Well, Dante doesn't know, the, the pilgrim doesn't know what he, if he's going to do this yet. Wait a minute, what are you telling me? You're a ghost? You say you're Virgil? I don't know if I really can, can do this. Tell me, tell me more. But Virgil says, look, you're just going to have to trust me on this. So Dante, the pilgrim, decides he's got no choice. He's got to trust this older poet to show him the way. And so they begin their journey. Those are the first two cantos. I closed the book and said, maybe this is speaking to me. Maybe Dante is my Virgil. <laughs> that's, but no, that's too much like a cliche out of a movie. It's not really true. I put it back on the shelf and went home, but I couldn't quit thinking about it. Finally, a week or two later, I ended up buying myself a copy of the Commedia, as it's called in Italian, and started reading. And it, it changed my life, as you'll hear. The, the Commedia is structured in three books to represent the Holy Trinity. The Inferno, which is a trip through hell. The Purgatorio, which is a trip up a mountain, a purgatory, where the people who are going to heaven eventually, they have to be, they're forgiven of their sins, but they have to be purged of the tendency to sin so they'll be strong enough to bear the glory of God when they get to heaven. And, of course, Paradiso, which is heaven. Um, you can look at it this way. Um, hell is, in, in Dante, is an allegory for what it's like to be lost to our sins and to, be, to have no, no knowledge of God. In purgatory, it's, the, it's our life in Christ on this earth. Everybody in purgatory is saved and going to heaven eventually, but they still have to struggle with the desires of the flesh to purge themselves of that so they can be made holy and ready for heaven. That's like the life a after we become Christians in Dante's allegorical system. It's a life after we become Christians, but we're still struggling on this earth with our sins. And of course, heaven is to live with God forever. It's helpful to think of it, of, of the structure of the Commedia, like the biblical exodus. The inferno is slavery in Egypt. The, the purgatorio is the wandering in the desert to kind of get Egypt out of them to make the, the Hebrews ready for the Holy Land. And of course, um, uh, Paradiso is the promised land. Well, on the journey through hell, the pilgrim Dante has to rediscover sin, what sin means, what sin is, and how he himself gave into it. I had always thought of sin as breaking God's law, breaking the rules. That's how I was raised. Um, and, and it is, in a way, but it's much, much more complex than that. The way Dante pre presents sin, and he got this from St. Augustine, is that sin is disordered love, that all of our sins come from either loving the wrong things or loving the right things in the wrong way, either too much or too little. But this was really helpful for me because instantly when I discovered this, I said, well, that makes sense. The relationship between me and my parents is one of love, undeniably, but it's disordered love. They can only love me if I am just like them. And my dad really did think that by not being like him, I was, I was doing it on purpose, you know, because in a rightly ordered world, if I understood my, my place, I would, be, I would be exactly like him. And my sister thought that too. I say that he and my, my dad and my sister were the ba Bayou Confucians. They really saw that the point of life is to find your place in the hierarchy and do your duty. Um, but I, so it was a fruitful way to think about what sin is, as disordered love. And I thought about my own disordered love for them. Why did I demand that they approve of me? You know, why did I need that so much? This was disorder. I saw what Dante meant about disordered love in Canto V, which is one of the, the first major encounter in the, in the Inferno. It's the circle of the lustful. Now, the way the Inferno is set up, it's a spiraling pit. It goes all the way down to the bottom where Satan is in the pit of hell. But um, Dante sets it up like that, like a spiral, to show us how we lose ourselves to sin. It's not like usually one, you just fall off and there, boom, there you are in hell. It's slow. It's through habit. If you think about it, what a spiral is, is a repeating circle that's making a progression. 
you know, but in a circular way. That's what sin is. If we get into the habit of sin and don't turn away from it and don't stop the progression, eventually we will move down to where we're so lost we can't even get out of it. Um, in Canto 5, the, the lustful are punished. And there Dante sees, he walks there, and the way it works in the Commedia is they, um, the punishment fits the crime. So the, they walk there, and there's this tempest blowing. There's a gale, a hurricane gale, and all the lustful are blown around forever in this gale because they have been, as they have been blown around by their passions in real life. And he calls two people out of there, out of there um, Francesca and Paolo. They had been real people who lived in, in Italy, Fra and they had been lovers, fr adulterous lovers. Francesca had an affair with Paolo, who was her husband's brother. The husband discovered, and ki discovered them and killed them both. And there they were, punished for all eternity in, this ca in the circle of lust. Um, I had not, lust was not a particular sin I struggled with at that point in my life, but watching how Francesca talked about how they fell into this sin it really made sense to me, because what she talked about was poetry. She talked about, she's talking to Dante about it. She blames everybody else for what happened to her. You find this out at hell. People blame everybody else <laughs> for their own, but, but it's their own fault. And uh, she goes, well, you know, we were reading love poetry. And she starts quoting lines of love poetry back. And she quotes a couple of lines that Dante himself had written early in his life. So Dante, it's not, it's not his fault that she's in hell, but he's implicated because he wrote lines that, misled her because in early in his life, like the other poets, they praised lady love and love, love, love. Romantic love is going to save us. This is what she believed. And she, she and Paolo followed their own heart. And they, they read, a, they read a, a novel one day. Then they kissed and that was it. They were killed. Um, reading this story, I thought, I thought about myself when I was a, a younger man before I became a Christian. I was in college and right out of college. I wanted to be in love more than anything else. I thought that if I just found my one true love, then everything would solve itself, that, that my life would be perfect. And I kept under that, that illusion. I ended up nearly wrecking my life and wrecking the lives of the women who were unfortunate enough to get involved with me <laughs> uh, before God finally let me bottom out and said, you know, you can, you can continue this way or you can have me. And uh, that's when I really... I, I converted and became a Christian. But uh, in reading this canto, in this canto of Lust, I saw this guy Dante, he really, he's on to something. He knows something about human psychology because this is how I was earlier in my life. And what it did, even though I, I didn't see myself currently in the canto of the lustful, I knew that Dante had authority because I knew this is a man who knows something about the human person. The first big turning point for me was the circle of the heretics. Now, in this particular circle of hell, the heretics are people who did not believe in eternal life. They thought the only thing that, that existed was this life, the material life. There was no life after death. They, got, they, they died, and then they got a rude surprise. They, they had to spend eternity living in open graves with flames coming out of them. Well, Dante's walking by with Virgil, these graves where the sinners, the, or the, the damned, are in there, you know, standing in the fire. And out of one of these open graves rises this man, this arrogant man. He, he's an aristocrat from Florence, and his name is Farinata. He really lived. He was a Ghibelline general. And he rises up and says, I hear the voice of a Tuscan passing by. Come closer. Let me see if you're worth talking to. Because <laughs> he was so snotty. And, uh, and you're thinking, you read that, you're like, wait a minute, you're, you're in hell? And a guy has come to you from your town, and he's alive, he's mortal, and you're going you're gonna to talk down to him? But that was Farinata's character. And so Dante comes and starts talking to Farinata, and you find out they were on opposite political sides. And so they start trash-talking each other across <laughs> political lines. And I'm reading this saying, this is so stupid. Dante, just walk away. You're never going to convince this guy. He's so prideful and he's so arrogant. And then it hit me. This is me and my dad. My dad is Farinata. Far the real-life Farinata was so proud of his family and their position in Florence and what they had accomplished and on all the land and his place in the town and his place in the city and that pride 
had caused him to place all his love on his status in the hierarchy of Florence. And prou- he was proud of his palace and all this. My dad was a, was a southern farinata. And there I was, Dante, arguing with him. I'd been standing there arguing with my dad for 30 years. And nothing had ever changed. My dad was stuck in that mode. But I had the power to walk on. And I realized that's what I needed to do. And I went to see my priest. I'm I'm an Eastern Orthodox Christian. We have confession. So in confession, I said, I have to tell you, Father, I'm an idol worshiper. It's like, you're, wait, what? (laughs) I said, no, I I realize in reading Dante that I have made an idol of family and place. And my dad is the personification of that. And my sister, my late sister, I gave them the place in my heart that belonged to God and God alone. And I'd already learned from Dante that we can only really order our loves rightly if we love God and put God first. As a Christian, I thought that's what I was doing, but in fact, that's not what I was doing at all. I had put my dad on a pedestal and, de- and wanted so badly for him to love me and approve of me, and I was never going to get it. Meanwhile, I had thought my whole life that God didn't love me. Well, I knew he loved me because he's God and has to love me, but I knew he didn't approve of me. And, um, but then I realized this, I, I'd seen God the Father in the same eyes as I'd seen my own dad. And I had to repent of that. And I did. I repented of it in confession. And I laid that burden down at the foot of the cross. And after that, things got a lot better for me really fast. But um, it was astonishing to me that I couldn't see what would have been perfectly obvious to any Dr. Phil or any armchair Oprah (laughs) about how complicated it was between me and my dad and what I needed from my dad, but I had to read about it in this poem from the 14th century for it to be real. Um, So here was the thing that was interesting about that. It's not that loving family in place is bad, but if you love them supremely, then what should be an icon of God's goodness, which is to say a window through which the glory of God shines and blesses us, becomes an idol to our damnation. And that was something that I had not counted on, but suddenly I knew it. Um, All throughout the rest of my journey through the inferno, I saw parts of myself in nearly all of the damned. I saw people from my life, but I also saw myself. There was never a point where I would see a character and think, oh, that's my mom, or that's so-and-so, without saying, and that's me too. Um, In each case, each one of the damned, whatever their sins was, as I said, they chose themselves and their own passions over God. In other words, they chose their own disordered love. They ultimately chose themselves instead of God, and that's how they ended up where they were. Um, I also, around the same time my wife, uh, that I began the Inferno, my wife insisted I start seeing a therapist. Um, And I said, please, no. You know, I was very proud and thought, I don't need a therapist, thank you very much. And... uh, but she said, no, you do. Look at you. You can't get out of bed. Go see a therapist. Again, I had nothing left to fight her with. I said, well, may as well. But I'm not going to like it. And <laughs> so I went. I, I was very prideful, and I, I went to see this guy. Mike Holmes was his name. He was a Southern Baptist pastor, but also a licensed therapist. And I went to see him on that first day and told him my story, and I was ready for him. I was ready just to sort of swat away anything, he, any s- advice he gave me, because I was really too smart for a therapist. <laughs> and, um, and so he listened to what I had to say, and he goes, well, listen, and it took the whole hour, but he said, listen, um, by the time you and I get finished, I'm going to help you understand that you cannot change your family, but you can change yourself. You can change your own heart. And that's going to make the difference. I said, thank you, Dr. Phil. And, my, and Actually, I said, thank you. But being a Southerner, I just thanked him and smiled but inside. I thought, thank you, Dr. Phil. We'll see how well this goes. Um, I uh, also developed this deep relationship with my priest, Father Matthew Harrington. You know, I, I would go see him for my confession. And he didn't know Dante at all. He's an Orthodox priest. But uh, he could see that I was getting some deep spiritual benefit out of reading this Catholic poem. And he's like, well, just keep doing it because I can see progress there. And he gave me a prayer rule. He gave me an hour a day of doing the Jesus prayer, which an, it's an old, old, th- going back to the early, the early church, it's an old prayer that's simply, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the way the Orthodox prayed, if you use the prayer rope, you have to clear your mind of everything and get still and practice the presence of God. For me, to 
do this an hour a day was, I, it would have been easier to climb Mount Everest because <laughs> my mind is always racing and I'm always so analytical. I want to like read a book to give me the answer. Here, right? What's the answer? What's the plan? What do I need to do? But he was telling me all you need to do is sit still, be very quiet, and ask God for mercy an hour a day. It was excruciating, but I did it. I did it because, you know, what else am I going to do? I'm there sick and I can't get out of bed. I began to notice, though, as I continued on my journey with Dante and my journey with the therapist, Mike Holmes, and my journey in the confessional with Father Matthew, that the storytelling of Dante, they flew, the stories flew below radar. They made the lessons that the priest and the therapist were trying to tell me somehow they, they entered into my imagination in a way they hadn't before. And I, could, I, I was only later able to understand how that happened because I had built up such uh, intellectual defenses against nonfiction, you know, against these arguments, to, so I wouldn't have to see what I didn't want to see. But when I'm reading this story, I mean, it just went into my, straight into my heart. And suddenly I could see these truths in a different way. Um, they made these moral and spiritual truths accessible to me in a way they had never been. I found out something interesting too. Neuroscientists have studied how story works on the brain and they, they found out, they, they gave some test subjects, they wired their brains and gave them a piece of nonfiction to read that made certain moral points and arguments. And then they gave them a story to read that made the same points but they, it embedded it in a narrative. And they found that people's brains reacted differently to both. They, they remembered the story much better, the lessons in the story, but they also found that if the people would be reading about a character walking, the part of the human brain that lights up when you walk also lit up. So in a, in a way, the story becomes incarnate in your own brain. Your brain reacts differently to a story. And that was what happened to me, you know? And I, what happened to me was the stories of Dante were decentering me from myself, taking me out of myself and reorienting me, letting me see myself from a different vantage point. At the same time that this Jesus prayer was decentering me from myself too, making me stop my brain from just running, 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 trying to figure out the answer, trying to get the right angle on the problem, trying to analyze things to death. Just let me be quiet and let the grace of God, let the Holy Spirit work in my heart. Purgatorio, part two, um, as I said, it's everybody who gets to, to the mountain of purgatory is going to heaven. I, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I don't believe in purgatory. It's a Catholic doctrine. But uh, and if you're evangelical, I'm sure you don't believe in it either. But if, you, if you've read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, this is what purgatorio is. It was based on that. It is a way of going, of making yourself spiritually stronger, being purified so you can bear the full glory of the light of God. Um, if you don't believe in actual purgatory, then think of it as, as I said earlier, an allegory for the journey in this life, our life in Christ. It's all about our, our sins have been forgiven or the sins of the people in purgatory have been forgiven, but their tendencies towards sin have to be purged. And you'll notice too, if you read Purgatorio, that it is also a journey of a spiral, but the spiral goes upward. It's, um, it tells us something about the way that repentance affects our soul. If sin, r the repetition of sin, leads us gradually in a spiral downward, the continuing to, to live a life of virtue and holiness and repentance helps us spiral upward toward heaven. Um, we uh, typically don't alienate ourselves from God in a single life, but by repeating them over and over, and also we don't immediately have our friendship with God restored by a single act, but it has to, I mean, God loves us when we ask for his mercy, we are saved. That's true in Dante, the medieval Catholic, as it's true today for, um, for evangelicals. Uh, but uh, the point is that to be transformed and discipled in Christ and to be slowly transformed by the Holy Spirit requires constant repentance, constantly saying, I'm sorry, constantly turning back to the mercy of God and asking, forgiveness. Uh, on the holy mountain, which is the mountain of purgatory, the pilgrims can only move up when the sun shines. This symbolizes the way God's grace works. Dante's telling us that we can't do anything on our own. We can only, only improve by the grace of God. But we have to walk ourselves. We have to walk in the light 
uh, God's not going to move us ourselves, but he's going to give us the grace by wi- and the light by which we can walk. But when the sun goes down at night, people can't walk because they have to rest. This is really helpful to me because so many times in my life, and I know if you're a Christian, you've lived with this too, um, you feel like everything's going great and you're making real spiritual progress and then boom, God seems to withdraw his grace. Like, what happened? Where, where'd he go? What's going on? Well, Dante's trying to tell us this is normal. <coughs> God needs us to rest sometimes. We can't be always up, 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 up. And uh, it helped me not to freak out when, as I was making progress in reading the Commedia and in my own repentance and come working on my problems with my parents, um, there would be bad days, and I would just start to think of them, well, this is a day of rest. Don't be alarmed by this. Um, as soon as Dante lands on, on the beach at the base of the mountain, he has to gird himself with a reed. Uh, in ancient Christian iconography, you'll c- you can see an image of Christ, the suffering Savior, as he's about to be crucified, depicted with a reed next to him. This is a sign of his radical humility. And this is in the Commedia, a sign of humility. Dante's telling us that we cannot progress spiritually without some humility. It was hum- only by humility that Dante submitted to Virgil's authority early at the start of the journey. And here, now that Dante is safe on the other side, you know, out of hell and in purgatory, he has to be even more humble, presuming nothing, except that he, has to, he can only proceed by God's mercy and with God's grace. Well, he has to get on with the journey. When he first gets there, he's so happy to be out of hell, and all the other pilgrims who are, who are landing on the beach with him are, are so happy to be there that they start to like, oh, I'm so happy to see you, and they, they start to play music and laugh. But then the old man who guards the beach says, stop it, this is not the time for that. Get on with it. You have somewhere you have to go. Well, what Dante the poet is telling us is that unity with God does not end with our turning from sin and having the altar call and accepting Christ, you know? (laughs) That's only the beginning of things. There's a lesson here for any of us who believe that if we just pray the sinner's prayer, we're in, we can go do what we want. That's only the beginning of our journey. Uh, We have to continue the struggle. Uh, The big breakthrough for me on the mountain of purgatory, and I'll I'll, I'll kind of move things along here because there was so (coughs) much, so much happened on every single level. Um, It was at the Terrace of Wrath where the sin of anger is dealt with. Dante, the, the pilgrim, walks into the Terrace of Wrath. It's one of the circles of the mountain. And suddenly there's this black smoke, choking black smoke with sparks flying in it. This symbolizes what anger does to us. It, it, it envelops us with fire and smoke, and we can't even see in front of us. Um, this was really, really something I had to deal with because I was so angry at my parents for the way everything had fallen apart that I struggled to see them for who they really were, and I struggled to see myself. Dante the pilgrim runs into a man named Marco, a Lombard, and he says, oh, Marco, I've come from the world, and the world is such a mess. Uh, Back home in in Italy, there's city against city, family against family. People are tearing each other apart. The church is is a disaster. The pope is corrupt. What do we, how do we get to this place? How can we fix it? And Marco looks at him and says, brother, the world is blind and you too come from the world. You're blind too. And people, you people in the world think that you can't help yourselves, that, that the, st- the fates are making you do this. It's in the stars. The stars are forcing your actions. They do. It's, the fate and nature has something to do with it, but God gave you free will. God gave all of us free will. If you will exercise that free will and say no to your passions, then God will help you, and eventually you can conquer this. He tells him... Um, Essentially, he said, if you want to seek what's wrong with the world, look into your own heart. If you want to heal the world, heal your own heart, and the rest will follow. And I thought, what did Mike Holmes tell me on the first day of therapy? (laughs) You you can't fix your parents, but you can heal your own heart. Man, that was a moment of repentance for me. Of course, I went right back to confession. (laughs) uh, But that's how it was. That was how the medicine worked, having to face my own brokenness and my own complicity in my own sin. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, 
my, my priest, Father Matthew, said, uh, loves to say, the church is a hospital where you'll be healed. But don't think the church is a place where you can come get an injection to kill the pain. Some t that, that will not heal you. It will just distract you from the pain. Sometimes the only way to be really healed is to suffer and to feel pain. And I could see that was happening to me, that as much pain as it was for me to go deep into my heart and face my own brokenness, my own sinfulness, that was how the healing was taking place. Um, after the encounter with Marco on the, the Terrace of Anger, I knew that any solution to my situation with my parents <laughs> depended on me putting aside my own anger. I was completely helpless in the face of it. But I was assured that if I put my own will in the hands of God and exercised my free will, that he would send me the grace to overcome it. It would not be a quick fix, but it could be done. Later, on the, uh, higher up the mountain, and the circle of the gluttons, I had to confront my own gluttony. And I'm not just talking about my belly, though that is a big issue for me. Um, I do come from South Louisiana. <laughs> but um, it gave me a new perspective on, on suffering and the role of suffering in our healing, which is something we can't talk about in American life. We don't talk about it in the church much. We don't face it in our family. In my own family back home, we could not face it. We would not see that my sister was dying. My sister would not see that she was dying of cancer. The night before she dropped dead, she was skin and bones. She went to a prayer meeting and told her best friend on the way home she was on oxygen. She said, well, we'll go back to see the, onco the uh, oncologist tomorrow, my husband, Mike, Mike and me, that's her husband, and I think the report's going to be not good, and I think it's time for Mike and me to have the talk. Her friend Abby said, what talk? She said, you know, the talk that I might not make it. Ruthie had lived 19 months with stage four cancer. She was nothing but a skeleton at that point, and yet she and her husband had not talked about how she might die. And the next morning, she died in his arms. They were so scared of suffering, you know, and I realized she was heroic in the way she bore it without any sorrow, but I came to see later that it was a kind of terror, you know. It was like, if we just deny it stoically and keep going, it won't get us. But it did get her. On the, mount, and, on the terrace of gluttony, Dante sees the gluttons coming by, and they are skin and bones too. They look like concentration camp victims, but they're singing praises to God. They're so happy. Dante recognizes one of his old friends from Florence, Ferese Donati. And he says, what are you doing here? You look horrible. And Ferese says, ah, don't worry about it. I'm happy because I know that this is just temporary. And I, I brought this on myself, but I know that by this, I'm being healed and brought closer and brought ready for God to be with the Savior. I, he says, I'm uniting myself to the same Savior who died for me on the cross. That was radical for me. You know, I began to understand this is what this is all about. This is what God is doing for me. He had to break me in order to heal me. The, the, and I had to be patient. The gluttons, they're tested on that, on that level. There's a tree, a fruit tree, glistening with water and ripe fruit, and they run up to it, and they're jumping for it to try to get it, and a voice comes out of the tree and says, not yet, not yet, and they run away happy, the poet tells us. Well, I thought that has to be me. I have to wait on God. I have to learn to wait on God and not lose my joy because God knows what he's doing. Things are going to happen in God's time. And uh, this terrible thing I'm going through, this struggle with my parents, it's made me so sick and so depressed. If I look at it as necessary for my salvation, it'll be easier to bear. And if I learn to wait on God and to trust that he knows what he's doing and there will be healing at the end of this, I can bear it. The last book in, in the Commedia is Paradiso, or Heaven. And that's th it gives us a, s uh, a picture of the way things ought to be if we lived fully in unity with God and with our neighbor. It's life in heaven. In, in, in heaven, it's a realm of light. The souls there are completely transparent to each other and to God. They're dwelling fully in God, but they're also fully themselves. Dante has to get stronger spiritually as he progresses because he's going to face God, to meet God. But he, he can't, he's told, you're not strong enough here. This light will burn you and destroy you if you don't take it slowly and get stronger as you go. Um, well, I myself at that point was far from paradise myself. I, I continued to deal with my anger, and I was angry about the injustice of it all. You know, like, 
why are they treating me this way? I moved my whole family home. And over and over, I played the unfairness of this in my head. And I had to realize this is what my dad was doing. How did I get a son like this? Why is he not? I went to see Father Matthew in confession one day to confess my anger again. And he goes, why are you so angry? And we were standing at a podium like this. That's how it's done in orthodoxy. The priest stands here. You stand here with the Bible in front of you. And I pounded. I said, I want justice. He looked at me and said, what does love have to do with justice? I go, well, what do you mean? And he told me, God loved you so much. There's, he didn't demand justice from you. He loved you anyway. He gives you his love anyway. And he expects you to love your parents that way. Do not expect justice from them. It's great if you get it, but you s that doesn't free you from the obligation to love. And um, I found that really hard, a hard saying. God, but I knew he was right. I knew I could not accept the love of Christ, which I didn't deserve, but also deny my love to my parents. And so I kept, even though I didn't feel it in my heart, I forced myself to keep seeing and keep serving them. By th those days, I was making my dad's pill boxes because he was really sick and was having to fill his pill boxes. And I kept going over there, not because I wanted to, but because love demanded it. In the <coughs> early in the Paradiso, Dante comes upon a woman named Picarda Donati. She's a sister of Ferrese, the, the guy he met in, in the, the realm of the gluttons. And she was a nun. She really lived. She was a nun who was dragged out of her convent by her evil brother Corso, the guy who organized Dante's exile from Florence. She was dragged out of the convent and forced into a political marriage. And she died young. Well, in heaven, she's on a lower rung because she had broken her vows, and uh, the vow of, of celibacy. And Dante says to her, I don't get this. It's not your fault. The guy dragged you out of the convent. Why, why does God hold you responsible for that? It doesn't make sense to me. Picarda shakes her head and says, you totally don't get it, do you? Here in heaven, we're just so happy to be with him. He gives us everything we need. I can't understand why this happened, but I don't need to. Because, she tells him, in his will is our peace. The most famous line from all the Commedia, in his will is our peace. She says to him, brother, the power of love subdues our will so that we long only for what we have and thirst for nothing else. And in his will is our peace. I thought about that, said, what is God's will for me with my parents? It's clear his will is for me to love them and not return their anger with anger. To dwell within the will of God is to live within love, and that is justice. The love of God is perfect justice. I could not deny to my family the love and the mercy that God gave me because that would be unjust. I could not live in an in injustice. And by continuing to harbor this resentment and this grudge against my parents, I was being unjust to them. Picarda, the nun, was free because she wanted nothing but God and his love. I knew that this is where I needed to be as well. I saw my family around this time as behaving like the jealous older brother in the prodigal son story, only willing to love me if I met their terms. But this was me too. I knew then without a doubt that I could not change their hearts, but I knew too with God's help I could change mine. I could turn it to love, not anger, not meditating on injustice. I knew I could have peace only if I dwelled in God's will and was satisfied with what I had and committed to loving my family no matter, even if the love that I received in return was imperfect. After all, hadn't God done that for me? Besides, if it's true that in his will was my peace, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that his will was that I love them in spite of everything. I committed to do this. It was hard, but I committed to walk that walk. I left Paradiso and finished the book in early December 2013. Around that time, my dad fell seriously ill and had to be hospitalized. <coughs> I went to see him and we very nearly lost him and he thought it scared him what happened to him and on the way home from the hospital one day he was in Baton Rouge I, I called Father Matthew and said I've just been at his bedside and you know this is going to sound weird to you father but I feel like I need to sit with him and ask him to forgive me he said I, I've been so angry at him and you know maybe he provoked it but I don't care I just want him to forgive me because if he dies I don't want him to go go into the afterlife and go see his maker with my anger on his soul. I need to get rid of this. Is that weird? Father Matthew said, I've been waiting two years to hear you say those words. So I went down the next morning. My dad was checking out of the hospital and the two of us sat there. My mom went down to get breakfast. 
And he was up, dressed in his chair. And I said, Daddy, I need to talk to you. I need to say something to you. He goes, okay. And I said, I've been so angry at you because things have not worked out between us. And I'm sorry for that. Please forgive me for having so much anger. And he looked at me tenderly and said, well, of course I forgive you. You're my son. You know, and I, I've forgiven many people in my life. There was that time I forgave. And he starts going on about... <laughs> And I fell back, and I was like, no, nah, it's not supposed to happen. But then I thought, nope, nope, this is about my heart, my heart. Focus on my heart. And so when I left and was following them, to the, to following them back home, my heart was singing. I felt in so much harmony with God because I'd said what I needed to say and had gotten rid of my anger. And I said, whatever happens, happens. I'm, I feel free. Well, we got through Christmas that year, and in January, I noticed that I hadn't, that was, uh, uh, hadn't had to sleep in the middle of the day in weeks. I felt better than I'd felt in years, and I was, for all intents and purposes, healed. We had theophany services at our church. Theophany is um, the celebrate when the Christ's baptism in the Jordan, when the, you know, the heavens open and the dove comes, and the voice of God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When I heard the priest read that gospel in church, I started to cry because I heard it from God the Father for the first time and took it into my heart. Mm -hmm. And I was only able to hear that and believe the gospel because of this terrible, hard, heartbreaking journey I had been on with Dante. And I just thanked God so much for the journey. I knew that I, that day that I had finally come home. Well, that's where the story ends in the book, How Dante Could Save Your Life. But there was more that happened this year that I need to share with you before we end. On Holy Thursday of this year, the day before Good Friday, uh, my dad called me and asked me to come over. I live about a mile from him out in the country and take him to the next town over to get a haircut. And I did that. And he was on his walker, walking very slow, and he needed my help. And on the way back home, he said, you know, I think that I'm probably getting toward the end making the last turn around the bend. I said, yep. Are you ready for that? Yep, I am. I said, you're square with God? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I said, have you, anybody you want me to call for you? Somebody you need to talk to? Maybe you need to mend fences? Because I knew there were these people out there. And No, I can't think of a soul. I said, well, Daddy, you know, you and I had a lot of stuff that we never fully resolved. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I've forgiven you. It's in the past, but I just want you to know that there are other people out there, and sin is a real thing, and you need to resolve this before you go because God expects us to do that. And he said, well, son, you know, I, when I did that to you, I had to. Because, and he started doing like somebody in the inferno, blaming everything that he had done on fate. And I, I stopped him. I said, you know what, let's not talk about it because I don't want you to think I'm holding this against you. I just want you to just to pray and think about things you need to do to get square and, and prepare, prepare your soul. Well, I said, this will never happen with him. Well, the next morning, I, I went over to his house. It was Good Friday morning. He was sitting on his front porch in his rocking chair, reading his paper, drinking his coffee. His walker was in front of him. I kissed him on the cheek, good morning, and I ran into the house to fix his pill bottles, to refill his pill bottles. And I was in a big hurry. I had a lot of work to do that day. So when I came out, I stopped to kiss him goodbye, and he grabbed me by the arm. And he said, looked at me and said, I don't know what I would do without you a very tender way. I said, well, thank you, Daddy. I, I appreciate that. And he wouldn't let go. He pulled me closer, and I kneeled down. And he said, and his eyes were filling with water, and his chin was quivering. A very proud man, so this was hard for him to, to say. And he said, I, 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 I talked to the Lord last night for a long time uh, uh, about my transgressions against you. And I, I, I told him I was sorry. And I think he heard me. And I just felt like, man, you know, this, this is as good as it gets, and this is great. This was like if you read Brides Had Revisited when Lord Marchmain <laughs> is lying on his deathbed and his eyes are closed. And at the very last minute before he dies, he makes the sign of the cross to indicate his repentance. This is what that was. This was my Lord Marchmain moment. I just kissed him and thanked him. And on the way home, I thought, Lord have mercy, if I had not if I had known what I was going to face when I came back to Louisiana, I never would have come. If I had not come back and gone through all this suffering, I never would have been there 
to hear my dad say, I'm sorry. I never would have done it. If I had stayed on the East Coast, or if I had left after I found out the truth, I would have been in such turmoil with my dad dying like that. I, um, it's the worst thing uh, for all of my life. I've dreaded the day my dad died worse than anything else because I thought my world would end. I mean, if, I, if you think about it, if you look at this man as like your God, the world, it is an apocalypse when your dad dies. I was so afraid of that day. And if I had left that town, I would have been in such torment and turbulence at that time, and I never would have been there to hear him say, I'm sorry. So I, I, I just thanked God for that. Later in the summer, this past summer, in August, my dad went into, or in June, my dad went into home hospice care, and uh, he wanted to die at home. There was nothing more they could do for him. Uh, in August, it got really bad, and they moved the hospital bed into his bedroom at our house, and he got to where he couldn't get out of the bed. At that point, I moved in because my mom, she just couldn't care for it. She was exhausted. And I said, let me take care of it. So I slept in his and my mom's bed with his hospital bed next to us. I was there for eight days. And I cared for him around the clock. And I got up to, to feed him. If he, what little food he could eat. I gave him his medicine. I gave him the morphine. I washed him. I was able to rub lotion into his dry feet. His legs were like sandpaper wrapped around a mop handle. They were so thin. And my, my strong, powerful daddy, those legs were just so strong. They could lift anything in those arms. And now there was nothing left. There was no power there at all. And he depended on me for everything. And all just being there for him, I would read the Psalms to him. I would read stories to him. And... Uh, just being there for him meant everything. And I couldn't see our history together and all the fights, all the arguing, all the hurt, the hurtful things I had said, the hurtful things he had said. He had said, all I saw was love, his love for me, my love for him. And all I wanted to do was love. Everything else fell away. Um, my, my niece Claire, my sister's second daughter, she's 16. She went off to the same boarding school I went to and she had, she had been very obstinate, very stubborn, like my dad and my sister. And she had been the one who had kept us at arm's length. But this past summer, she experienced a rebirth of faith. She went to a Christian camp, and I knew she was serious about prayer. So when she came home from school on the weekend, we, we called her and said, Paul's going to die soon. Come on home. And when she got home, I went out of the bedroom, and she was sitting at the kitchen table. I said, Claire, would you like to go pray with me by Papa? She said, I was hoping you would ask. So we sat there in his darkened room. We prayed together for him, and he fell asleep. And I remembered my lesson from Dante. Humility, humility. Don't be afraid to be humble. And I reached over and took her by the arm and said, Baby, I am so sorry about the brokenness between us. Forgive me, please, for all the hurt I've caused you. She drew back and said, We don't hate you. We don't. And it just came pouring out of her. She said what happened was they had not prepared her for her mama's death, her or her sister. She said, we didn't expect her to die. I said, you didn't, but you saw she was nothing left to her. She goes, I know, but mama didn't want us to see that, and we didn't want to see it, so we didn't see it. And when she died, nobody would talk about it. We just had to be quiet and keep on, and we didn't know what to do. Our dad wouldn't talk about it. We just, that was our culture, just keep going. And what they did was they fell back on what their mother had taught them, anything to make sense of the world. And one thing that made sense of the world is, Uncle Rod's bad. And she asked for forgiveness. She said, we shouldn't have done that, and I'm so sorry. So we hugged each other and said, we both have Christ between us. Let's never let anything come between us again. And that moment at my dad's deathbed, he was sleeping that was the family was healed right there because of humility and because of steadfastness and love. And I was just so grateful to God. The last day my dad was conscious, it was just the two of us sitting there, and I could see he was fading into the mist. And I said to him, I said, do you believe Christ died for your sins? And he said, I do. He could barely talk. I said, do you trust him to be your savior? I do. That was it. He fell asleep. 
And again, I th- said, God, thank you for making me to, li- to be here to say those words to him. Because who knows what would have happened if, if I hadn't been. It was a privilege to be there. Daddy died with me holding his hand, and uh, my mom held his other hand. Every one of his surviving children, which was me, and his grandchildren were around his bed, in his bedroom, in his home, that he built himself. And his friends were there too, his closest friends, their hands on him, praying. Uh, when he passed, the moment he breathed his last, we all said the Our Father, and then sang, I'll fly away. It was a holy death. It was a glorious resolution to the conflict, and my, the father-son conflict between the two of us. The harmony was perfect. You know, we, when a musical note resolves in harmony, it's, it, the, the notes are still very different, but they're on the same, they, they harmonize, and that's what my dad and I were at the moment of his death, that last week of his death and at the moment of his death. I didn't cry at all because I was joyful, because the work of God in the past, in the, the, the three years I had been there, the work of God in my dad and in me and in our family was such a triumph. There was no reason to cry. But that night, I went, finally went back home to my house, first time I'd been home in eight days. And I was sitting at my kitchen table, and I was thanking God for giving me the grace to stand on love and not justice, and giving me the people to help me in my life, Mike Holmes, my therapist, my priest, Father Matthew, who said, I gave you that prayer rule because I had to get you out of your head. You were stuck in your head thinking you could figure it all out, and you were never going to figure it out. You were condemning yourself. And thanking him for my wife, Julie, who forced me to get out of the comfortable place where I'm and, and to get out of the dark wood and go follow somebody who could lead me out. If, I had not, if God had not given me that grace, I wouldn't have been able to be by his bedside in the hospital in Baton Rouge to ask his forgiveness. I would never have been on his front porch to hear him say, I'm sorry. And I would not have been there to make sure that he had accepted Christ. And I wouldn't have held his hand as he breathed his last and entered into eternity. In Paradiso, there's a sinner named Kunitsa. She had been a very, um, she'd been a real dame in Florence. She had had uh, like four husbands, and there she is in heaven, a great sinner who was saved, and Dante sees her. And he says, well, how do you, you look back on your sinful life, what do you think now that you're in heaven? And she goes, nobody here mourns their sins. When we look back on our sins from heaven, we just smile because it makes us realize how great was God's mercy and how much he, what he delivered us from, how much he loved us. Uh, it was the same for me, looking back on all the suffering I'd been through in the light of my dad's death. It was a refining fire, and I'd walked through it, not by my own power, but by the power of God and with the help of some people who loved me and whom I allowed to help me in my humility because I was so broken. My pride had to, I had no choice. When I sat down to thank God for that, I remembered Picarda's words, in his will is our peace. And that was the first time I cried. And the only time I've cried after my dad's death, they were tears of gratitude. Um, I want to end by saying something about the role that art and beauty played in my healing and deepening conversion. The shock of beauty in this poem, not just the formal beauty of Dante's verse, but the power of Dante's narrative is what drew me in. The course of the story of Dante's pilgrimage was one of continual revelation. The more Dante the pilgrim saw and heard and felt, the more he repented and the easier his journey became. In paradise, Dante can't bear the intensity of the light of God's presence. Each step in the journey was a step in purifying his heart so he could be strong enough to bear God's glory. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That is the commedia right there. That's the lesson. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This work of of incredible intellectual and artistic brilliance, unparalleled in Western civilization, in the end, comes down to the heart. It's about conversion of the heart. A Christian writer halfway around the world suffered a great loss 700 years ago and rediscovered the way, the truth, and the life out of it. He left his testimony behind for us, like a message in a bottle tossed in a sea of time. It washed ashore in a bookstore in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I found it on a summer day, opened it, 
and I read the map that led me home from the shipwreck of my life back to safe ground in my father's house. There is nothing that the good shepherd cannot use to reclaim his lost sheep. We will not be able to see the shepherd on the hilltop beckoning to us, calling us home, if our gaze is turned within into the dark wood of ourselves. Wh wherever you are today, God will meet you there, and he will send you a Virgil. If you think about it, he probably already has. You probably have Virgils in your life right now that you just don't see. You have to be willing to humble yourself to follow him toward the light. I would invite you all when you leave tonight to reflect on your own lives and the ways God is speaking to you. Dante Alighieri was a Roman Catholic of the Middle Ages, and that meant that he saw the world sacramentally. That is, he believed that God was, as we Orthodox Christians say, everywhere present and fill, filling all things. He believed that God often speaks to us and sends us his grace through the good things that he has created. I'm not asking my Protestant friends to change their metaphysics, but I am asking everyone who is wondering where God is and why he won't give me an answer and why he allows me to suffer to think about the still small ways he is speaking to us even now, even in our suffering, especially through our suffering. There may be a wise elder in your life that God has sent to lead you to safety. There may be a work of art, even an Italian poem, through which God is calling you to repentance and a deeper relationship with him. Maybe God allows you to suffer, to cause you, as he did to me, to open your eyes to see him and open your heart to let his love be present in your life. That is what happened to me. It took the shattering of my illusions and the breaking of my body to shock me into reality and to remove the blinders of my own pride and vanity. Once I learned to see God working with my eyes, I began to see all the world with the eyes of my heart and his presence in it and his purpose in it, and I was healed. I was healed and I am being healed every single day with each difficult step up the holy mountain toward God. That is what happened to me. Glory to God for all things. Thank you.